everybody? Hi. Oh my God, we haven't even had one yet. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hey. Hello. Uh, I appreciate a lot of you turning out after a busy day of work. And uh, for me, it's very special to see some former students. Uh, th that uh, reminds me of how special it is to form relationships outside of the classroom. That's uh, one of the reasons why I've been teaching for a hundred years. Um, <laughs> So I have a lot of passion, as Duncan said, for uh, this topic. And uh, so I'm going to condense a, a six-hour talk to two and a half hours. And, uh, but, but I promise you, you're going to have wine by about 7.30 and, and, and get home uh, you know, at a reasonable hour. Um, so let me just ask you, okay, and you can shout out the names. If I were to ask you, uh, to think of, you know, great leaders, that is, think of people living or dead that you think represent really absolutely sensational leadership. You would probably come up with names like, this is where we interact, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln. Jefferson, Jefferson. Jefferson. Jack, Jack Welch, Jack Welch. Nelson, Mandela. Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Nelson didn't hear it? MacArthur. MacArthur. Gandhi. Gandhi. Okay, great. And so you can try this, uh, you know, at work. You can try this at the dinner table with your kids. The fact is you always get the same names, now, the names we've just heard. And if I, we went on even longer, we'd hear Churchill and Lincoln and Martin Luther King along with Gandhi and MacArthur. And, and the fact is that's because when we think of great leaders, we think of visible leaders, and what they've done that we've either read about uh, in school or we've actually witnessed. And the fact is, um, that is what I call the myth of the great man. Because, uh, in fact, leadership is really not about daunting heroes facing incredible challenges. That's really not what leadership's about, at least organizational leadership. And, and the fact is, that's not what leadership's about. It's largely, you know, a myth for a couple of reasons. One, you know, organizations are so complex that it's very unlikely for a single man or a woman to have uh, the skills to successfully solve the problems of the day in that organization. Uh, number two, galloping technology is such that very it's very unlikely for a man or woman to have enough information, enough expertise to solve all the problems of an organization. And probably most importantly, uh, all throughout history, there are lots of examples of what you know, great leadership is really all about. That is you know, galvanizing and energizing individuals uh, into teams to achieve great results. So because I'm a frustrated professor, I have a, I have a quiz for you. So if I were to ask you who painted the Sistine Chapel, arguably one of the greatest artistic achievements in Western civilization, and now Duncan said you were smart, now we're going to find out. You'd think for a minute and you'd tell me it was Michael Angel. So 1508 to 1512, um, we have this image of Michelangelo on his back, on his scaffold, paintbrush in one hand, candle in the other, for five years, you know, toiling by himself to create this masterpiece. The fact is Michelangelo had the help of 13 brilliant Renaissance artists of the day and a crew of over 200 artisans preparing the paint mixing the plasters. But if you ask anybody who painted the Sistine Chapel, uh, of course we all think it's the single individual, and we know that's not the case. If I were to ask you, who's the father of animation? That is, who had this vision for taking short cartoons and translating them into, you know, full-length feature with music and drama and emotion, You'd probably know quite quickly it was Walt Disney. Walt Disney. 
And uh, there's no question that Walt Disney had this vision. Uh, there's no question that, in fact, he went around to studio heads of the day for funding, uh, asking Cecil B. DeMille and, and uh, Sam Goldwyn for a loan. They thought he was crazy. Who would pay money to see this full-length feature animated film with music and drama? Um, but the fact is, uh, our friend Walt never drew a single frame of any of his films. What he did do was go out and find 200 of the best artists and illustrators he could find. And furthermore, he asked the California Institute of Art to set up within the Disney Studio a school to teach these artists and illustrators how to animate films. He never drew a single frame. Furthermore, we, we, we see our friend Walt there with the, probably the most famous Disney icon in history. Um, we all know about these Disney characters. Our children know about them. It just so happens that Walt was going to call the famous mouse Mortimer Mouse. It was his wife who said, listen, Walt, Nick's gay on the Mortimer. <laughs> Not a good idea. It was her idea to call this mouse Mickey. Third part of the quiz. If I were to ask you, who's the father of the Mac? That is, who created the Macintosh computer? You think for a minute, and of course you tell me. Steve Jobs. Hey. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. In his younger days. <laughs> and uh, there's no question that Steve Jobs had this vision for uh, a device that would be as ubiquitous as the television set. And it was no question he was smart enough to take the Mac team off-site so that they wouldn't be distracted by the, by the corporate suits and headquarters. But if you ask Steve Jobs, not known for his small ego, who really invented the Apple Mac, he would tell you it was his best friend, Steve Wozniak. That is the person who had the technical genius. So while he was a visionary and a great marketer and had great design sense, the person responsible for the Mac, according to Jobs, was not him, but Steve Wozniak. And finally, I think the paradigmatic, paradigmatic example of what leadership is really all about. If I were to ask you, who's the father of the atomic age? That is, who was asked by the War Department in 1943 to head up a, a group that would ultimately move to Los Alamos, New Mexico, be known as the Manhattan Project. You might know it was J. Robert Oppenheimer. Interesting about Oppenheimer. 1943, asked by the War Department to head up this effort to ultimately beat the Nazis in coming up with an atomic device. Uh, he was 37 years of age at the time. And the average age, he was considered the old man of the group, the average age of the scientists in Los Alamos was 25. It's the average age. No computers, some calculators. At its height, there were 2,100 scientists, engineers, physicists, there's ultimately uh, 10,000 people in, in Los Alamos with spouses and children. And very interesting about Oppenheimer, um, he was shy, he was retiring, laconic, definitely not charismatic, uh, mercurial, and yet um, whatever your politics, ultimately by August of 1945, uh, a, Two devices, two atomic devices are operationalized. So he, he delivers, yet he would not be anybody's definition of a leader, and he wouldn't match the Gandhi, Lincoln, Jefferson uh, persona that many of you mentioned about 15 minutes ago.